Next up, uh, we have Jamie, Jamie Barton, who's the head of developer relations at Graph CMS. Jamie's hey, hey. hi, Jamie. Welcome. Uh, Jamie's going to be talking about federating the content layer. So uh, over to you, Jamie. Excellent. Thank you very much for having me. So, hey, um, I'm Jamie. Thank you very much for attending this talk. We will be talking about uh, federating the content layer. So I'm going to kind of go into what that is and what that looks like. So we at GraphCMS, we're a headless uh, API uh, content management system. Uh, we really pride ourselves on kind of delivering structured content uh, at, at scale. Um, we are one of the first, if not the first, GraphQL uh, headless CMSs. Um, and we're completely GraphQL native to this day. So we created this when GraphQL uh, first came around. And we're still GraphQL uh, backed right now. And that's all we provide. So we're really kind of focused on providing a great experience um, for uh, delivering data, uh, structured data, uh, through the GraphQL API that we have. Um, we have powerful content editors for um, anyone editing content. You you have kind of loads of different tools uh, at your disposal. Um, and I'm going to go on to the, in this talk a little bit about what some of that looks like and how we're kind of doing things a little bit differently. And what we're doing differently is in the area of content federation, uh, as my last point here. So this is this idea to join all of these different kind of uh, sources uh, and kind of put them on different destinations. So I'm going to go into this uh, in a little bit more detail. But like anything, like this talk where I'm going to be talking about what we're doing now and what we want to do in the future, I think it's important that, you know, as with any kind of talk like this, that we bring up um, the past to justify the uh, the future or the, or the present even. So if we rewind a little bit um, and we kind of go back to the where it, where it pretty much all began, um, we were used to using uh, FTP to upload files. And really back then it was just websites, okay? So we had websites that we wanted to create content for and for our businesses and, and whatever it be. And we used FTP to, to get the files there. And there were some weird ways that we could use to connect to um, you know, live instances of our production uh, endpoint and, and uh, website and, and edit that content. But really, that, that was about it. Um, you know, there was slowly becoming a requirement to author content and have a structured way to do that with some kind of workflow um, and, and maybe change templates and, and things. So you know, where it really started, um, this kind of CMS idea um, was a traditional CMS. We The requirements are fairly simple. Um, you know, it all started with this need to be able to edit content and have it display online. Um, and without that kind of step of, okay, FTP and files, and ugh, that was yuck, like having to upload files and edit files. I remember just editing files on the live site, and it's not an experience that I want to go back to. Um, so we, you know, we had a bunch of websites and, and uh, all these kind of digital experiences that we wanted to power, um, and really we needed some kind of system to do this. And this was what you know we got used to as the traditional CMS or the coupled CMS. It was primarily website based. I'm going to say a lot of a lot of the use cases for the CMS was just for a website, um, and it was pretty much theme based. Like you got a few themes, you could yes, you could change them, and you could bring in your own themes, and you kind of uh, you know you were coupled to putting things in places that you were told to, and you didn't really have much flexibility as a developer um, to, to kind of go any further with this. So everything was really tightly coupled and it was, it, you know, it was fine uh, during that time, but you know, our, our kind of requirements outgrew that, uh, I think we, we all know of. So another thing um, with the traditional CMS was, you know, you pay for everything. So once you get the CMS, um, whatever you want to kind of output on the front end, whatever system you used, you paid for everything. It was all in or nothing. Um, yeah, there was open source tools that you could run and deploy yourself, but um, there was kind of a you know a movement to kind of headless CMS, and we'll go on to that in a second. But you uh, back you know way back when when you were working with the traditional CMS, you were hosting this yourself, and it was often quite slow because it was only deployed to one central server. We didn't have CDNs and anything like that back then. And if we did, it was really painful and time consuming and costly to, to maintain all of that. So this is a bit about the, the past. And if you've been following along to some of the, the newer trends of, of using headless APIs and things like the Jamstack, you probably remember way back when most of the stuff was server rendered unless you uploaded it via FTP and uh, a static files and what have you. So a lot of the, a lot of the things that made it slow was those round trips to the database on every page, um, which we've kind of, we still can do today. Um, but we, we, 
we've kind of picked up a lot of new trends along the way to kind of help us do that. So some of the tools you probably remember back then, uh, back then was things like Drupal, Adobe Experience Manager, WordPress, um, uh, Joomla. Uh, they kind of took care of all of that. We had these tools we could log in, we could add users, they could edit content, they could structure content, and they could click publish. And that was about it. Like the developers would take care of how that content looked, but you know there was not too much control and flexibility uh, beyond that, really. Um, you know, and these are often today referred to as the monolith, as I'm sure we all know um, at API days. So I think it's important that we cover the present. The, and the present is, you know, this is where we are um, with most CMSs today. That content, it's pretty much outgrown the internet. Like it's not just about websites, it's about um, mobile applications. And, you know, even in cars, I think my fridge has a display on it and there'll be somebody somewhere managing content. Um, so yeah, uh, we've kind of outgrown the internet and the headless, CMO, uh, the headless CMS is pretty much evolved to solve that problem of that omni-channel uh, content distribution. So, you know, we've got all of these different tools now and, and CMSs that are headless at our disposal um, to make all of this uh, possible. So what is the headless CMS? Well, this is my take really. Um, the headless CMS is mostly front end ag uh, agnostic. You can use whatever framework, whatever tools, whatever languages that your team or you are familiar with and you don't kind of have to go um, you don't have to kind of go much more beyond that. It's You can implement what you want and how you want it. Um, so if you're a company that's working with a specific language already or a framework, well, you can just pick a headless CMS and your team hasn't got a retool or anything. So, you know, significant costs um, in developer experience is kind of uh, kept the same. So that's pretty cool. But most of the headless CMSs are pretty much CRUD based, right? You can create content, you can pretty much read that content depending on your access levels, uh, and you can update that and delete that again based off your access levels. We get inputs, text areas, and you know some of the more advanced ones allow us to kind of relate content um, and maybe to show things like a map or whatever inside of the application that we can use, and that kind of powers the front end. So most of them are CRUD based, and quite a lot of them, including Graph CMS, go that extra step and give you a lot more kind of different tools for content editors. And I want to go on to this in a little while um, when we talk about the future. Um, yeah, most of these again are um, certainly with the headless CMS are decoupled and they give developers that you know, huge amount of flexibility, like I say, to implement whatever front end they like. Uh, and it's an API, so they can just interact with it in the way that they're maybe familiar with, with using uh, other APIs. One other area, though, um, of the headless CMS is uh, the li these this limited starters, okay? So I maybe just get a headless CMS and I just get the CMS. What does the front end look like? Well, that's up to me. To some people, that's great because you have the ultimate freedom and flexibility to do what you want. But for others um, that have been sold this great idea, um, you're pretty limited on on getting started. So um, quite a few of them give you, you know, some reference application or starter to kind of take and tweak. But this can be seen as good and bad of the, the modern day headless CMS. And I think it's great because you've got the, the true flexibility, but including us at Graph, we, um, we give you a bunch of kind of starters and templates to get going with, whether that be for structuring your data and how you should content model that to the, the actual front end code with things, frameworks like Next.js and Nux.js and Vue and Svelte and the, all the rest of them. Um, you know, and with headless CMS, we've got all of those APIs and SDKs that we can use. And I think the benefit of having an API, of course, is that, you know, you don't need to learn a specific language if that tool only has an SDK in PHP or JavaScript or whatever, you can use what you want and communicate with the API and, and uh, directly with probably JSON or something um, over GraphQL. Um, you know, with the headless CMS, we also seen kind of a movement to S, uh, SVN for our version control. And, you know, we wanted more offline support, so we moved to Git. Um, and there's been, um, you know, huge advancements in there and how this kind of is connected with the continuous delivery of pages on the internet. As a developer, if I change the structure or layout, I can create a pull request and have that go live on the website. And my content editors don't need to worry about that. I know my data is safe and they can change that whenever they like. Um, but I know my kind of continuous integration with my uh, Git provider will deliver the results seamlessly without any time, downtime. So that's really cool. But that kind of brings me on to, you know, um, what things look like in the present. We have this bit in the middle. We've we've come from no CMS to a CMS. And then we have this, uh, this thing in the middle, which is the custom middleware, okay? So 
you know, we've got a, ri a rising uh, amount of destinations and where we want to put content. But now we've got a rising amount of the, the sources of that data as well. Content doesn't just come from one CMS anymore. Um, we have customers that have data in pins, e-commerce platforms, their orders are sent somewhere else. Um, they enhance marketing pages with the CMS or they have knowledge bases and, and, and many other things within the content management system. But not everything belongs there. Yes, they might use fields to kind of relate this data, um, but you know, not everything lives in a CMS anymore. We've outgrown that. Um, but you spend often spending a huge amount of time uh, dealing with this custom middleware. And if we go back to Hugo's talk at Red Hat about the event-driven architecture and how that looks, a lot of the different things that are going on inside the CMS or the e-commerce uh, APIs or the PIMs or wherever, they will trigger events that can then update things in other systems. So, you know, you've got some kind of consistency uh, amongst that data, but that's painful and it takes time to develop all of that. Um, you know, if, if you're building these kind of middleware integrations with uh, certain languages like Golang, PHP, Node.js, and uh, a, a bunch of others, you've got to get a team that knows how to use these and write this middleware. And you know, wherever it's deployed, you've got to have experts in GCP or AWS. And um, yeah, there's tools like serverless that kind of abstracts a lot of that, but you need to kind of bring people into a team to really bring that website that you want to kind of ma manage and the content in where it's delivered. Wherever the whatever the front end looks like, you've got to bring teams of developers together to to manage all of this, and it's a bit it's a bit meh. It's not what we wanted. Like we wanted this flexibility, but it's become a little bit cumbersome and confusing to manage. Um, yeah, there's the and, and there's services like the 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 logo in the top right there for Pipe Dream. This is um, this is a tool which you can kind of link um, data, uh, API endpoints, events, and you can kind of come through and you can do a, a little bit of magic and they'll host the code or you can set an integration. It's a bit like Zapier for developers and you can change how that data comes in and where it goes out and what it looks like when it goes out. And that's what I mean when I talk about the kind of custom middleware um, in, in the previous slide. This is really time consuming and expensive to, to manage um, for any business or team. Um, and quite often there's a lot of disconnect between all of these things as well. Not everything is aware of the other services. So you've got to build microservices and microservices of, of, of everything. But on the flip side, we do have the best, you know, we've got the choice of the best of breed uh, services for all of these different things. So I know I don't have to use a monolithic uh, CMS that can manage e-commerce. It can manage uh, anything, you know, any, any of my content and maybe send in a message or an email to somebody. I know I can use the best of breed services to do that and, and use all the reliable tools. I haven't got the worry um, to, to kind of... Uh, take all that on and, and host it and run it. So, um, we, you know, we get full choice and flexibility to do what we want, but there's the, now this bit in the middle that we kind of need to um, figure out what we're going to do in that space to make that easier. And there's tools like, um, you know, if there's a developer watching this, there's tools like um, the GitHub code spaces. They are trying to make it really easy for someone to just forget about their local deployment and stop fighting with whatever versions you've got of, of things installed and not having to kind of run docker containers locally. You can now just head into uh, head into a, a GitHub code space with your repository. And as a developer, it's really easy to just kind of make changes uh, online from, from anywhere in the world without having to kind of rely on some, you know, uh, the, the next, uh, the next uh, laptop to that's powerful to run at all. So, um, and, and, and again, another one is stack blitz uh, is, is a great tool to just allow developers to, to get started with something very, very quickly um, in Next, Nuxt, and, and a bunch of others. And this is really, really helpful, um, but it still doesn't get around that problem of managing everything. It's certainly a lot easier to edit and maintain that middleware now, but we still got to maintain it and manage it. And you know that's the bit we've got to figure out. So yes, all of these are kind of lowering the barrier um, for entry for the developers to, to write all of this stuff, um, but we still have to maintain uh, that middleware. So. We're going to fast forward to the future now, um, and we're going to look at where Graph CMS is, uh, where we think we sit right now, um, and where we're going to kind of uh, go on to next here. So if we break this down a little bit, uh, you know, this is beyond headless and kind of the current state of things. Um, you know, really, it's to become, we would like to become kind of agnostic to the front end uh, and, and uh, the back end, as well as kind of uh, give people the content services. So if we have a look at this, we have... Um, Hasura uh, and Apollo, they are great services. Um, and they are services um, 
uh, that manage data. Okay, but GraphCMS, we manage content. So that's how we're different uh, in, in that space. And the others, well, the, um, the, uh, they're, they're different because you know we're, we're completely backend agnostic and the others, um, they just have a database that you connect to and they have a UI and, and, and things like that. So we're trying to be a little bit different with some of the things we got on. And you can see on the right there, a bunch of the different things that we're, that we're good at um, and, and, and what we're doing in this space. And I know we're short on time, um, but uh, I'm happy to dive into this uh, a little bit more later on. But uh, please take a screenshot of, of this um, if you're curious to, to see where we're headed in, in this specific direction. But I think we're, 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 we're here already. Um, we recently introduced this concept um, of remote fields to GraphCMS uh, and UI extensions. And what this does is it gives developers um, all of the tools they need to bridge that gap for the content editor. So content editors can come into the, uh, the, the CMS and they can edit content that may live somewhere else. Like that's that's amazing. And then a developer, they can query from the, the CMS and they can get that data. But again, it could be coming from another platform. So we can kind of manage and enhance and augment all of that within the one tool. And that, you know, we're making huge innovations in the tooling for developers to to kind of, instead of writing middleware for every single thing, they write middleware for the, the CMS platform that's taking care of the communication. And then all developers need to do is worry about that little bit, it working for the CMS. And as a content editor, you don't need to log into 10 different tools to check on things. You can log into one and you can see everything that's going on. And I think that is really, really powerful in the age of multiple sources and, 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 and destinations for all of this. So. Here's a few tools. Um, again, you know, it, you can pretty much integrate whatever you like. Um, all of the tooling uh, is there for you um, to use. Um, and, and no matter what tool you're using in the back end for your content and all of your data, you can bring that straight into GraphCMS and pipe that on through to whatever uh, thing you need on the front end. So completely agnostic to where your data comes from and where that content goes. I have a few videos here. Um, like I say, the middleware can be made or made up of different things. Um, but as a UI extension, this is just one example. Here we have an input field for uh, the, the binder, which is a data um, uh, digital asset management platform. Here I've opened up uh, something which is part of the binder SDK. It launches this application inside of GraphCMS. I can click on things, I can filter, I can do all of that stuff. And then I save that and it's saved right inside of GraphCMS. That data can then be uh, forwarded on through to the front end um, with, with what's stored there. So that's really powerful and kind of gives people the ability to do what, what they need with whatever service they want. And if I can move on to the next slide. We have another example, which is again with Cloudinary. And again, I haven't really styled the button or anything here, but this shows that we have the Cloudinary. Uh, and, and these appear in modals, but you can do whatever you like here. These can appear in inline, you can make them full screen, you can do whatever you want. Um, you have full control to to manage the editing experience inside of the, the CMS. So here's just another example um, of using the Cloudinary picker. And this launches my assets inside of Cloudinary that I'm able to select and have that go on through. So um, I'm gonna skip the next demo just cause I know we're short on time. Um, but essentially what we have is an e-commerce uh, application here. We've got the price and the stock and the availability of that stock coming from a, um, uh, a service called Content Layer and everything else like the image and the description and maybe it's the, the reviews, well, they're being hosted, hosted with GraphCMS. So we've got all of that. Uh, so I'll leave a link um, maybe it's later on uh, for anyone that wants to watch that video or head on over to the YouTube and you can find that in a, a little bit more detail. But essentially this is what's going on under the hood. We have a query that's fetching products. It's fetching all of the, the data from GraphCMS, but then it's merging it with data that comes from third-party APIs. And our CEO, Michael, spoke to tons and tons and tons of different customers. And we found that this is what a lot of people are trying to do, but they're, they're stuck with all of these tools that makes you write all of this yuck code in the middle that you have to maintain. Well, I, I believe with the tool that we've got, this is the direction that 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 the industry is going and we're, we're there. Like we've made the tool and available. And if you're curious to learn more about this, please head over to the blog uh, and please head over to the docs where you can find all of the, the stuff to, to get going with all of this. And as always, it's free to get started with the platform. So thank you for listening.
Thank you, Jamie. That was uh, that was fantastic, and uh, I, I loved the, the demos, the videos. Um, got a got a couple of questions here. So uh, the first is: uh, Have we looked at any of the open standards for CRUD, like MicroPub, or looked to standardise the API across different providers? Yeah, this is something um, which we are currently experimenting with. We are currently innovating. Um, uh, well, we are currently innovating in what I was talking about the remote fields. And we're kind of looking at a standard way to make that possible um, by saying this is, you know, you provide your um, Swagger file or your GraphQL endpoint and we can read the types. And then we can either stitch that together and make that content uh, available throughout. Um, but we haven't looked at kind of defining a standard itself for all of this different content. But I certainly think that is uh, needed in the future um, as we have all of these different uh, data types. So hopefully that answer the, answers the question in some way. You're on mute. Sorry. Uh, sorry, the other one. Um, uh, uh, next question. Uh, it sounds too good to be true. What is the catch? <laughs> no catch. All of the, the, the things that I've shown here um, are available to use. There's documentation there. Um, I think really the catch is just how fast can you can you develop and, and get started with this? Um, we give a lot of the tools um, for you to get started. We've got tons of different examples. Um, and there isn't anyone really in the, and certainly in the head of CMS space that's doing this as well as uh, we are. And I'm not just saying that because I work here. There isn't, um, I, I've not used anything which has kind of got all of this together. The services like I showed in one of the slides that give you access to data, but it's just data like it was in that CMS where you had to manage in PHP my admin. You couldn't really do anything or enhance it. We give you the content editing interface that allows you to do all of that. So no catch, um, but you know uh, we're free to get started. And obviously, as you scale, the catch would be this pricing uh, associated with it. Yeah, all, 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 always a catch, I think. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay, but thank you very much, Jamie. Um, uh, it's been really, really interesting. As I said, certainly I love the demos. I'm re really powerful. So, thank you very much. Yeah, and enjoy, enjoy the rest of the event.